I know that he's not going to be here. What? It's uh, um, close to 9 o'clock, so let's get ourselves assembled. We will be missing the two people remotely today, and we also are missing one other counselor who had to make a fl flight this morning at 6 o'clock. So. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine. Okay. Right, ten. So I'm. I have my ten people. Good. Dorothy's. Oh, you're right. I'm missing Pat. Who wants to call and wake her up? <laughs> I think that's the job of the president. <laughs> I'm sorry? Okay. Um, first of all, we are not doing this by Amherst Media, but we are recording, and we're doing that so that the people who are not able to be here, um, or yourselves, have an opportunity to review the material in the future. We will also make a link to the recording available on the town website so that um, the public that is not able to be here can also view it. Um, with that, let me call the meeting to order. And um, the first, I'm sorry? Oh, all right, let me stop then. Amherst Media, are you ready? Good morning. Um, for those of you that were with us last evening, it's just a few hours later, and we're continuing today with um, actually an opportunity to both educate the council and the public on two of our major departments within the town. And so we're delighted to have that opportunity. We plan to meet today from about 9 to about 11. And as I mentioned earlier, um, though I wasn't sure we were being recorded, there are two people who are not able to be here, actually three people who are not able to be here because of circumstances that allow them to miss a council meeting. So with that, Mr. Bachelman. Thank you. Um, so this is the first of our presentations uh, to the council from departments. I really appreciate the time that the counselors have, are going to give to this effort. Um, I know there's a lot of demands on your time and that you were here until after 11 last night and that you're here at nine this morning. So there is coffee in the back room. That's, so if you need to get that extra boost. So the way we are, we've, um, are organizing this is by department. We've had our major departments who are uh, being prepared to provide just an overview of their departments and answer t general questions that you may have. This morning, we're going to kick off with our Department of Public Works, uh, led by Superintendent um, Guilford Mooring, who you saw last night, and Assistant Superintendent Amy Rusecki who's here. Um, and then after that, we'll flow into the superintendent of public works and the finance director, or no, I'm sorry, superintendent of schools, this is superintendent morning, and the um, finance director from schools who will take the second hour and again, do a presentation to you. Uh, we feel like this is an opportunity for our department heads. They've been eager to get in front of you <laughs> and have, have the opportunity to show off what they do because we have incredibly talented staff um, and for me, I just wanted them to be able to, you to meet them, see them in action, um, and then also um, for you to ask any kinds of questions. And there'll be more coming on. So, Great. turn over to Guilford and Amy. That's perfectly fine, Guilford. Thank you so much for being here. And Amy as well. Okay, so uh, good to see you again. It was just like yesterday. 
So um, the Public Works Department is actually one of the larger departments in the, in the public town government, not, not the schools. Um, we are actually a little bigger than the police and a little bigger than the fire. So we're about 65 employees, and I'm going to start a slideshow. Um, I debated on whether to, wait, to ask you to wait till the end to ask questions, but I think um, as you see a slide, you have a question, just go ahead and ask the question, okay? And we'll just move through. Um, this is our organization. There's a superintendent, which is myself. We have a director of operations, which is Amy, Amy Rizeki. Uh We have an administration office, and then we have the town engineer, which is Jason Skeels. And then you can see who's underneath it and what falls where. There's roughly seven operational divisions, we call them. Highway, water, wastewater, tree and grounds, vehicle maintenance, street lights and traffic lights, traffic signals, and solid waste. And then we have a support staff on the engineering side, which is actually pretty robust. And I've actually moved them to the end of the presentation because I understand there's lots of engineering questions about what roads we pave and who we use for consultants and all that stuff. That's all at the end. So how do we get our money? Everything we do has needs money. We are one of the departments that gets a lot of different types of money. Uh, general fund money goes to some of the divisions, and I'll point those out as we go along. The water fund pays for the water division. The sewer fund pays for the sewer division. We have a solid waste fund as well, which pays for the solid waste issues. And then we also participate in the transportation fund. We have employees paid by the transportation fund, and we actually do almost all the maintenance of the kiosks, parking meters, that's all paid for, and we handle all that in public works. We get uh, grant funding, mostly the money we get every year is Chapter 90 money. That's a grant. Uh, then we also get our general fund capital money, which comes to the Joint Capital Planning Committee, which pays for road repair, sidewalk repair, street lights, some traffic signal work we do. Um, those type of things come from the general fund. Also pays for our vehicle replacement, mostly. We get other grants. You'll hear about these as you go along. Community Development Block Grants, CDBG. Complete Streets Program, which is a mass highway program. Mass CEC, which is the Massachusetts Center for... Environment. Clean Energy Center. Yeah. We actually, we're on our third, we're on our third grant with that agency, and we do that through our wastewater side. We partner with UMass and Mass CEC, and we do a lot of innovative technologies and piloting down at the wastewater treatment plant and at the UMass pilot plant, which is next door to us. Uh, we also get Mass Works grants. We haven't got one in a while. The last one we got was the roundabout triangle on East Pleasant Street. And then we get a lot of reimbursements. We do work for the schools. We do work for other communities. We do work for the housing authority. We do work around town and do, do things, and then we get reimbursed for that. Um, the last thing we did was we were supporting the South Deerfield Water District, where they were going through some operator changes, and we actually provided operators for them when they needed them, and they reimbursed for our time and effort to be there. That helped them out a lot and helped them move on. We do a lot of stuff for the school, like I said. We do a lot of paving. We did the tennis courts at the school. Uh, we do parking lots at the school. We've done some drainage work at the schools. Um, we're pretty much a construction firm for the town. So if somebody in the town needs to do something, they come talk to us and we put it into one of our bigger projects or we make it a project for all in itself. So I'm going to keep going unless I see people raise a hand or... So you get a combination of general funds, fees, and grant funds. Yes. Okay. So then this is the 2019 budget minus the schools. That's just a pie chart showing the overall 34, 34.3, 34.4 million dollars and how those funds break up among the general. We're a big share of what goes on in this town. We sometimes get forgotten because when you call the phone and you're looking for a fireman, you don't really care for a public works person. And when you call for a policeman, you don't want a police person. But we're a big part of what this town does. So we're broken up in seven operational divisions. I'm going to start with the tree and grounds. So in the tree and grounds division, there's a division director who's also the town tree warden, Alan Snow. Alan Snow is a very qualified individual. He actually served as the president of the Mass Tree Wardens Association probably about five, six years ago. 
Um, he's involved in all the work they do as well. So uh, he's very he's a certified arborist, and he brings a lot of experience to the table. Um, this group, as you can see what they do, they kind of do a lot of things around parks and commons and downtown. One of the inv individuals in this division is funded through the transportation fund because we maintain the parking spaces and clean up around all those bus stops and so forth, and that's paid for by transportation fund money. Um, this group also picks up all the trash out of the public receptacles you see around town and at the parks and commons. They work, there's somebody working for this division every day of the week. They're a seven day a week operation. Highway division. Highway division is the biggest of the general fund divisions. Oh, sorry, tree and grounds is also mostly paid for by general fund money. Highway division is almost exclusively paid for by general fund money. <clears throat> These are what they do. They do all the road maintenance. So we can crack seal, we can pothole repair, we mow, um, we shim, which is a, a big pothole pair repair with a big machine. Um, and then they <clears throat> do all the other things you see here. Traffic sign maintenance, there's two people in this division who maintain the parking kiosk and parking meters, and they get some money from the transportation fund to pay for that. There's two people in this division who also do run the Vactor truck, which is the big truck with the elephant hose on the front, and it sucks out catch basins. It also sucks out the sewer, sanitary sewers and some of the work around the pump stations. So this division <coughs> gets money from the sewer fund as well as the general fund to support that operation. Um, this is our go-to division if we need to do something. If we need, uh, Town Hall says they need a generator after the September 30th snowstorm, October 30th snowstorm, not September, October. Uh, we realized we didn't have power in this building, so we installed the generator. This is the division that comes in, removes the old asphalt, builds the pad for the generator, installs the conduit for the generator, sets everything up for our electrical division to come in and install the generator. So this, gen this group can do a lot. They do pipe work. They do just about everything there is to do that we need to do. They don't do water main work. That goes to another division. I must be answering everybody's questions. This is great. <clears throat> the water division. Water division has 13 employees. Everybody in the water division is working towards being a certified operator. They all have to have some type of operator certification. Whether you're a treatment plant operator or whether you're a distribution system operator, you're certified by the state to have that position. Atkins Water Treatment Plant is a T3 certified facility. The T4 is the highest you can go. T3 is what the DEP certifies that one. Centennial and Baby Carriage are T2 facilities. Our distribution system is classified as a D3 system. D4 is the highest. So we're, a pretty big, we're pretty big systems in treatment for water and uh, distribution of water. Are all of the water reservoirs within the town of Amherst? No. We're actually the largest property taxpayer in the town of Pelham. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I figured. And we, uh, we pay property tax in Leverett and Shrewsbury. So we have our, our big reservoir, Atkins. There's a little piece of it in Amherst, and the rest of it's in Leverett and Shootsbury. And then we have the Pelham reservoirs. Um, I don't know where any of those things are. So you're, you're answering the reservoirs question. OK. <laughs> so we have four reservoirs, um, Atkins. And then we have a complex in Pelham, which has the Hall, Hilly, and the Intake Reservoir. Those are three reservoirs. We have three storage tanks, which are water storage tanks. We have a small one, which is next to East Pleasant Street next to the big one, which is actually owned by UMass. We have the small one. We have one in behind Village Park Apartments, and we have one in uh, Bay, off of Bay Road at the south end of town. So those tanks are large tanks that store water for keeping a uniform water pressure throughout the whole system. We have three water treatment facilities. We have the Atkins Water Treatment Plant in the north end of town. We have the Centennial Water Treatment Plant, which is in Pelham, which is actually kind of offline at this point because of some damage that's sustained during a storm. And then we have the baby carriage water treatment plant, which is in the south end of the town. So the baby carriage plant's the one that's different from the other two. It actually treats for iron and manganese, and it treats well water only. The other two treatment plants are surface water treatment. You know, I hear those terms come up every once in a while. 
for their surface water, baby carriage, as well water treatment for iron and manganese removal. <clears throat> we have five wells. They're just basic wells. One, two, one, two, three, four, five. That's our, their names for them. <laughs> we're, re we're really complicated in this world. Well four is the big one. Well four works with baby carriage. The water from well four is high, high in iron and manganese and has to be treated at baby carriage. Um, well five is what we call Rudy. This is our backup well, and when we really get in trouble, we turn Rudy on and we let Rudy run for three or four days, and then Rudy's done and has to sit on the bench for a little while longer. It has to recharge. It's a very small well. Wells three, one, and two are almost always on, and they fluctuate as the pressure in the system, the system pressure fluctuates and keep, maintains pressure. They start and stop automatically and keep everything going on. Three is the primary well that runs constantly. And then you'll see one and two jockey on and off to maintain pressure as needed. So it's a pretty complicated, for such a small town, it's a pretty complicated water system. Um, but it works really well. And then the distribution system is the pipes in the ground. There's 120 miles of those. A um, couple questions. This does not include the campuses. The campuses get water from the town. Okay. UMass buys water from the town. Amherst College buys water from the town, and Hampshire College buys water from the town. And do we provide sewer for them? We do. And what percentage of the residents or other operations, buildings, if you will, in Amherst do not have public water or sewer? It's getting to be a smaller and smaller number. Um, the percentage of people who are probably on private wells is probably maybe 5%. Maybe a little lower. There's very few private wells in town anymore. Se septic, there's a larger number of people on septic. It's probably 10, 15. Are those private wells concentrated in a particular area? I'm sorry. Uh, are those private wells concentrated in a particular area or areas in town? They're, they're in different areas. Mostly they're on the outskirts. If you actually were to look at a map, um, they're on the outskirts. Probably the biggest un, unwatered and unsewered area of town is the High Point area. That area is right. above our hydraulic grade line. We cannot actually get water to them without making serious changes to our water system. And we have not put uh, sewer up there because there's a lot of ledge and it'd be uh, a lot of work to get sewer in up there as well. Thank you. So it says we produce two and a half to four million gallons of water a day. If there's not a drought, what is there like a number of residents or a number of people that that can support on a regular basis? And if so, you know, how do you grade how much water is enough? And if so, where where are we on that? You want to do that? So the the state actually does have in order to make sure that people are doing good water conservation, they actually kind of set limits that are in our permit and how much water per person per day you're allowed to use. So our permit, I think it currently says 85 gallons per person per day, but our new, our permit's under renewal. The new one's gonna say 65 gallons per person per day. Um, we are consistently below that. A lot of times we're at about 55 to 60 gallons per person per day, so. And I know that at some point there's going to be a question about sustainability efforts, and so whenever you can weave that in, that would be great. We're going to be here for a long time. Sustainability will be here forever. Just a word here and there. We actually, um, we just finished a study. We had Tate and Howard do a study for us of what we should be concentrating on next. And one of the things that they brought up was we probably should look for another source of water outside the aquifers we draw from now. Um, for lack of a better term, uh, we, consider, we kind of consider the aquifers like scorpion bowls. And everybody puts a straw in the scorpion bowl and is drinking from the scorpion bowl. <clears throat> we have two aquifers we have primarily, we're taking from. We're taking from the South, South Amherst, the Lawrence Swamp Aquifer. We're taking water out of there. Belchertown's taking water out of there. And there's actually more private wells in Belchertown in that area than, than in Amherst. So there's a lot of people taking water from that area, and we take almost half our water from the Lawrence Swamp. The rest of the water we take from our surface supplies, which are in sort of the northeast corner of town, and that's another, another um, separate little aquifer. 
In our study we did, we did said we should probably find a third aquifer so we can balance out a little <coughs> more and have a little more uh, diversity, resiliency, sustainability in how we provide our water to the, our system. So we're actually going to be putting out an RFP to look for a, a possible well site in the northwest side of town. And that'll put us in another aquifer outside the three we already use. So then we'll have three scorpion bowls to drink out of, and then we can rotate them around. Our new Water Management Act permit, Water Management Act permit, you're going to hear a lot about this. Um, there's going to be a lot of re stress and pressure on us to jockey and manage where we're taking water from at certain times of the year. Less water from a surface supply during the hot weather, which because surface supplies tend to dry up during the summers. Um, more water from the wells at that time. Less water from the wells during winter when there's more water in the surface supplies. Uh, so we're going to be managing and having to do more of that. And that's all based around sustainability, building a resilient system, and maintaining <coughs> peak flows for other, other accommodations, such as mostly wildlife and the environment around us. Okay. Evan. So just on that, obviously, <coughs> sorry, obviously you maintain the, the infrastructure uh, for all of this, the land management for the reservoirs, is that also under your jurisdiction as well? Yes. <coughs> it is. There was a question over here on the right. Any, yeah, yeah Darcy. Um, Does the distribution system um, reach all the way to the far south Amherst? Does it reach the far? Yes, the distribution system serves all of Elf Hill, um, goes into uh, Bay, West Bay Road, Bay Road, does that whole southern end of the town. It actually loops through a part of Belcher Town. Well 3 is actually in Belcher Town. Um, goes to Belcher Town, comes back out of Belcher Town around Amherst Hills, Amherst Station Road area, and comes back in. Um, the only place the system really doesn't go to is the High Point area. Um, and then we get a little short in Levert Road, East Levert Road. We don't go all the way down East Levert Road this time. We don't go, to, we go all the way down Levert Road. We go down all the way down 63. So we pretty much, that's, we pretty much travel everywhere in the town. We actually go a little bit in the Hadley too. Was, was there a time in history that when you didn't hit Elf Road and Hulse Road? Because I remember hearing during the campaign people saying they were surprised that they had to have their own wells. Uh, no, we, we've almost, since I've been here, there's been water to the south end of town. <clears throat> Sewer's another issue. Sewer does not go to those areas. So everybody on that side's on septic. Okay. Is there an a, um, impact, a positive or negative, on uh, increased development in the High Point area, Flat Hills, things like that? Because if, of the uh, ledge, it said. If you want to increase development in that hill part of town, it's all got to be on wells or in septic systems at this time, unless the developer is willing to put the investment in to bring our water system up there. So, so the developer would be responsible for doing that? Yes, that's normally, if you're going to develop a piece of property that's off our system, you're responsible for bringing the system, if you want the system, to us, to, to you. So is Henry Street on the sewer and water or not? Henry Street's all watered. Okay. It's not all sewered. Okay. Thank you. Water is always popular. <laughs> uh, I'm just curious a bit, um, you know, especially given what we've seen in other communities about um, our distribution system, the status of pipes. I think you know where I'm going. Yes, I know where you're going. We have an old system. If you come visit us in the DPW, we actually have wood pipes in our conference room that we've taken out of service. Uh, they actually weren't in service. They were out of service a long time ago. Uh, but we do have an old system. We keep track of where we have the most breaks, and we kind of concentrate our repairs on the areas that are failing. We have cast iron pipe in service, which has been in service for over 100 years, and it's in excellent shape. Some of it's been uh, cleaned and relined, and it's as good as some of the newest pipe we've put in. We have some new pipe that's been in service for less than 50, 40 years, and it is trash. It is falling apart. It is, uh, 
it was thought to be the next best thing in pipe, and it's not very good, and we have problems with it. And we work to take those pieces out. Um, so we have an active maintenance program. Uh, next year, we're going to be taking out some smaller pipes, some small cast iron pipes, some four inch cast iron pipes, and two inch cast iron pipes, which probably are not in very good condition when we take them out because of the size. Uh, but we have an active program for doing that. I guess we'll move on from water. <laughs> All right, so once you drink the water, then you have to get rid of the water. So we have 12 employees. There's four maintenance personnel, and the rest are registered operators as well. And the wastewater side, plants are rated from one to seven. We are actually a grade seven wastewater treatment plant, and that's basically the complications of what you do at the plant. What, we do a little bit of nitrogen removal at the plant, and we do a lot of um, just different things that make us that complicated that we have to, we're grade seven. So our primary operators are licensed as sevens, we have several operators that are licensed at six, and our basic operators are licensed at four. So that's how we structure our licensing and how we do the operations there. We are under a permit. The permit is issued by EPA, not by DEP. DEP kind of gives us the side permit, but the controlling authority for wastewater in the state of Massachusetts right now is the Environmental Protection Agency. And we haven't heard much from them lately. Yeah, right. Three weeks and counting. Well, we actually did get a request from DEP for some information, which they would have usually asked the EPA for, but since EPA is closed, they had to ask us for it. It was kind of weird. We didn't know what to do. We're like, do we really should tell you this or not? Um, but we told them. Um, so we have the wastewater treatment plant, which I'll show you in a few minutes, is very large. We have a lot of maintenance goes on there. Um, we have 21 pump stations. We're soon to have 22. We'll bring the 22nd one on. That's going to be in Amherst Woods. Um, we do a lot of pushing of material up hills and down hills and up hills again to get to the tra treatment plant. There's three primary pump stations, Stanley Street, Main Street, and South Amherst. Those are the ones that almost everything go to, and then from those pump stations, they go to the wastewater treatment plant. We do daily lab testing and monitoring. We're actually authorized. We're not a certified lab. We're an authorized lab to do our own testing. And we're also authorized to do some testing for other entities. We test for UMass as well for some of the, the tests they have to do for their reuse water. Mm -hmm. um, again, we're currently a grade seven plant and our maximum daily flow is design flow is 7.1 MGD. Um, we've kind of been exceeding that over the last season. We've had flows that have been well over seven MGD, million gallons a day. Um, We've only had one issue where we've actually uh, released partially treated sewage. Um, it was during a very high rain event. So considering the, how everything is going and what's affecting all the other treatment facilities in the place, we are actually holding our own and the plant's doing very well. The plant is old. The picture on, the, on my right, your left, you're right too. You're, yeah, you're right too, okay. Uh, that was a plant in 1961. The plant on the current plant, it was built in the 70s and put in operation in the 70s. So you start adding together, things are now at the time for a major upgrade. We've been planning for a major upgrade. We've been trying to get ourselves in order for a major upgrade, but we're waiting for our new discharge permit from EPA. We haven't gotten it yet. We're concerned about, or what drives the permit and the plant upgrades is, what's the level of nitrogen and phosphorus we can release in our effluent. So as we treat the water, we get rid of the pathogens and all the, ba all the bad stuff that's in there. But then you also have nitrogen and you have phosphorus left over. And then we discharge that to the Connecticut River. That flows down the river to the sound, Connecticut Sound, and there's a little bit of an issue down there with nitrogen and phosphorus. So we know we're gonna get some limits beyond what we already have on nitrogen and possibly get phosphorus limits. That'll drive how we change and upgrade the treatment plant. So we're still kind of waiting for that, and it will be something we'll probably get within a year or so. Is that the treatment plant right behind the Mullen Center? Yes. <coughs> okay. And for all you who want to know, we're in Hadley, and we're one of the bigger taxpayers in Hadley, too. Right. So we're in Hadley, and we pay taxes to Hadley, the wastewater treatment plant. You said you'd been exceeding 
sometimes the, the maximum gallon limit, whatever it's called, discharge limit, does that mean you're going to be, look to be looking towards upgrading to increase that limit at some point, or? Um, as we look forward, as we look, actually, if you look at the plant in the picture there, it was laid out for expansion. It was built as a regional facility. We're not a regional facility, really. Um, so we have capacity. During the, the low times of flow, we sometimes only have one of our clarifiers on. So let me do the little lighty point thing. So you have the primary clarifiers and secondaries are here. And during, there's three of each. During low flows, we'll only have one going. Then when UMass comes in, we'll have two going. And then during high flow events, we'll have all three of them going. And sometimes we park water someplace else in the plant, um, which we can do. So uh, we may have to go ahead and do the expansion that was planned when the facility was built or designed in the 70s and add the fourth clarifier to each of the primaries and each of the secondaries. And we're looking at we're possibly having to add uh, more aeration as well, which are the little, aeration is the little section over here. And Amy's going to add something. I was just going to add to that point that, um, I mean, a lot of why we're having such high flow, though, is because, you know, additional flow with all of this rainwater and high groundwater, it's entering the sewer system. And the state is actually putting a lot of pressure on communities right now to remove this. It's called I&I. &I, it's inflow and infiltration. And the state's putting a lot of pressure on us to remove that. And so there's going to be a lot of efforts also to try and remove that so that we don't have to expand this and can kind of withstand these wetter seasons a little better. So majority of stormwater infrastructure is also tied to, do we have combined sewer stormwater infrastructure? We don't. Um, so, and I think the only reason we're seeing it now is the groundwater is so high and if you have a sewer pipe that the joint is a little offset, flow is gonna come in. As you can imagine, um, wastewater is really, it's high in nitrogen. It, like, Roots love it. So all it takes is just a little crack and roots are gonna move towards that and then they're gonna expand into the joints and make a little crack a larger crack. So um, anytime you have just an infrastructure that's wearing down a little bit, those roots are, are gonna just keep making them worse and worse, um, so. Actually, actually, the way to think about that too is you have a sewer pipe which is six, six feet in the ground. The normal water table is five feet in the ground. The water table right now is about two feet above the ground. So you now have all that extra water pressure pushing in and even a small crack, which may get a dribble of flow when the at wa normal water table is almost like a flood now because you have so much hydrostatic head pushing the water down into that little crack. So that's what we're really seeing now is the ground saturated and all that hydrostatic pressure is going wherever there's a hole to go it, for the water to go to. That's why you have people who have lived here 15, 50 years who've never had water in their basements and now have water in their basements. Um, this could be the new norm. This, so we talk about sustainability is how do we live in this new norm and keep things going in this new norm of wet? Dorothy. Um, can you explain the concept of the water table being two feet above the ground? <laughs> It's when it's flooded. When the ground's flooded, the water table will be two feet above the ground. We actually have places where we, we are seeing flooding where there's not been flooding before. Some of our cross-country sewer lines, um, the, water, the ground around it is flooded now. So the water is above the, two feet above what, the ground level. Above the sewer line? Two feet above the ground, and then okay. the sewer line is still buried five or six feet below that. So really, basically, you have a sewer line through a pond, is, or below a pond. Thank you. OK, so those are our big four divisions, we call them. They're the, the big, lots of people, lots of things. They do the, a lot of operations, and that's pretty much what they do is operations. And then we have some smaller divisions, which are more support to the operations. We have equipment maintenance division. We have three mechanics. We work out of the shop behind the DPW. Um, there's two bays in that shop. We provide repairs to all our vehicles. We also do some of the smaller vehicles outside. We do conservation sometimes, uh, council on aging. We don't do the police, we don't do the fire, and we don't do the schools right now. 
There's been talk about us, if we build a new facility, making room for the schools to do school bus maintenance in our facility as well, which would be fine. It would be great to do that. Uh, their poor mechanic works outside a lot. <laughs> a lot. He's outside a lot. If he has to work today, he'd be outside getting wet. Um, so that would be a good thing for the schools and the DPW. Um, <clears throat> we do minor repairs, transmissions, springs, brake jobs. Anything that's really, really big, we tend to send out. Um, we do small engine repair, as you see. Um, we also do all the vehicle inspections for the town. So we're a licensed vehicle inspection station. Uh, we bring vehicles in. We on a routine basis. We inspect them, send them back out. We do police, fire, DPW, and schools, all those vehicles. Um, it saved us a lot of money. Used to be we had to be like everybody else. You go to your local inspection station, you get in line, you have to sit and wait because you can't make an appointment. So uh, it saves us a lot of time. We, we can schedule it because we, we control the station. While we will not at this point get into the condition of this facility, although we will later, I just want to mention that when the people are working in these bays, they don't have proper ventilation. We don't have proper ventilation in the, these bays, but these bays are the driest pieces of the building. Ah. Uh -huh. There you go. There's always a sunny side and there's always a dark side. We have the Solid Waste Division. Solid Waste Division runs the transfer station. Right now we have four employees there. One of the employees is a grant funded position. It's a waste reduction enforcement coordinator from DEP. We have this position until August of this year. And unless we decide to fund it, uh, that position will go away because the, the funding will go away from the grant. Uh, transfer station is open to all residents of town. It's also open to Pelham and Shutesbury and Leverett. That was an agreement that was set up a long time ago because we have our watershed in those properties and we were trying to offer them a waste disposal option instead of dumping it into the watershed lands around the reservoirs and around the, uh, around the reservoirs actually. Um, we uh, also operate under a DEP permit here as well. The transfer station has a license permit, and then the two closed landfills have permits as well. There's monitoring that goes on. There's groundwater monitoring. There's surface water monitoring. There's sediment monitoring and landfill gas monitoring as well. I always forget something. There's a lot of technical monitoring that goes on here. We do all this monitoring in-house now. We used to hire a consultant to do it, but it's easier for us. We rent the equipment. We do the gas sampling, and then we take the samples and send them off to the lab. One of our biggest contracts we have every year is our sampling contract because they do samples for water, they do samples for the landfill, and they do samples sometimes for wastewater. There's a lot of testing we do. It's all required by the state. Darcy. Um, just wondering if you have done much consideration of the recommendations of the um, Refuse and Recycling Committee about going to one hauler uh, no, <laughs> uh, this that that's kind of um, that committee is. You're gonna. I think you're looking at changing how that committee functions a little bit, um, and that's gonna be more of a sustainability type recommendation, and uh, than than actually how we operate the transfer station. The transfer station has n no control over the waste haulers, and DPW has no control over the waste haulers at this time. All the control over the people who pick up the trash in town is through Board of Health regulations. Um, so it's a bigger picture than the DPW saying we're going to switch to a haul, one hauler for the entire town. It's changing the Board of Health regulations. It's bringing the Board of Health on board and bringing on a bunch of other people on board to do that. So it's just not something that the DPW would say we're doing. It's mm -hmm. bigger. I have another question. Do you, uh, could you explain what Mimi Cla Kaplan does um, as far as she's the DEP funded employee and, and uh, how valuable her services are? So, so Mimi Kaplan is, a, is the wastewater, waste, what not, waste Reduction Enforcement Coordinator. And what she does is she's been going around and visiting the town, checking out what's out, put out, placed outside for trash, placed outside for recycling, talking to the haulers, making sure they know that, you know, you're really not supposed to pick up recycling that's contaminated. You're not supposed to, you're supposed to leave it behind. She's been doing a reach out to the renters or the property owners, letting them know and what the rules are, 
and trying to help them come into compliance with recycling rules that are the state rules and waste rules, which are the state rules as well. So she does a lot of outreach and then she has a lot of enforcement as, or as far as looking at things. She has not issued a fine yet. We haven't had to fine anybody yet. She's been able to talk to people and get them to change their habits and get them going again. Um, the one thing that's interesting about Amherst and DP chose us for this grant because of that is we change our community, half our community changes over every year. So if you educate people on what to do with your trash, you can't just sit back on your laurels and relax because next year a whole other group of people come in and you have to educate them as well. And they may come from places that don't have the same trash rules we have. So she's been very good at that. It's actually been a good position. She's able to talk to people and get them to do what they're supposed to do. Um, since we don't pick up trash, we don't see a direct impact from what our work is, but the haulers do see an impact and it is helping the haulers and helping the neighborhoods. Have we as a town ever considered, in fact, taking on the job of picking up trash? Uh, yes, before I got here, the town thought about having its own haul, own routes. Um, they did not do it. They did bring in, they did decide to do their own recycling routes and they did have two vehicles and they ran recycling and they picked up the recycling in town for a while um, when it first started, when the recycling first started. Um, but they've never, there's never been any serious real discussion about the town taking over and doing its own trash service since I've been here. Thank you. Uh, next, this is, uh, this is our street and traffic light division. This, this division has only been around since I've been here. Uh, we used to contract out all our traffic light and street light work. It was actually very expensive and we took a long time, longer than you think, to get people to come do things for us. Uh, we've hired two electricians. They <laughs> do maintain all the street lights, which the town bought our street lights. If you wanna know if we own a street light, you look for this little tag on the pole and every light we own has that little tag on it, except for the decorative lights downtown. We almost own all those. Um, they maintain the traffic lights, they maintain the school zones, all these things. They also do a lot of the troubleshooting around the wastewater and water. There's a lot of electrical components in the plants, the water plants, the wastewater plants, the pump stations. Um, they do a lot of that troubleshooting, they do a lot of that installation. We do a lot of our own equipment train change outs. The electricians will disconnect the power, maintenance personnel will come in, take out a pump, take out a whatever they need to, put in a new one, the electricians come back in, they wire it back up. Our big thing we're doing now is generators. <laughs> uh, we're, we're replacing a generator, we replaced a generator at baby carriage treatment plant. That one's being wired up now. We did the one at the, um, we did the one at town hall. We have another one we're gonna put in at well four. We have a broken generator at Mill Valley we have to replace and Puffton we have to replace. Uh, so we're, we buy those, we bring them in. Our guys install everything and hook it all up. And these, this, these two gentlemen do a lot of that work. They, one of the, <coughs> they did all, yeah, they did all the electrical in this room as well. So they, they're- Please good. thank them for that. <laughs> I will. Uh, they, they do a lot and then they also end up, I mean, they end up putting in a, a they end up putting them in an outlet somewhere and the next thing you know, they're ending up working on a 440 volt motor or something. So they're very diverse, they're very capable. They're also our front line for programming issues. And programming issues are not like the IT programming issues where your email doesn't work. Programming issues we have are where the motor controllers that are pumping that sludge are not talking to the device that's receiving the sludge and making sure the flow rate's right. So it's the process control manufacturing programming they do, not the video game or email type programming. <laughs> Although if you actually go look at the control panel, it looks like a video game. <laughs> Um, so this is a very important group and they've been very helpful and they've saved us a lot of money. So that, those are the operating divisions. And then we get into administration. Administration, there's five of us, Amy and I, there are actually two, and then there's the administrative staff that do a, a lot of the processing. <clears throat> we handle all the com processes, all the work requests that comes in. The C-click fix is the public side of how people can talk to us. You can email us, you can phone us. They'll take those and put them in as work requests. We're bringing up a separate program called 
Dude Solutions. It's really called Dude Solutions. <laughs> and uh, Dude, yeah, it's called Dude Mon. Uh, re remember Dude Mon, because there's another Mon coming up soon in this presentation. So Dude Mon is for us to manage our requests and group requests together that are similar so you can manage the workflow. We're still having a little issue getting that going, and we're still working on that. But that's coming to help us manage everything. Uh, we're one of the few departments that basically enter our own bills. We probably do every bill cycle, which is every two weeks. I don't think I've ever seen a bill warrant from us that comes downtown that's been less than $40,000. During the summer, during heavy construction time, time we'll process two or $3 million sometimes during a, during a bill process. Um, so we do enter all our bills. Most departments send their bills to accounting and the interim and accounting. We do all our own payroll entry, which is what the other two big divisions do, police and fire. Uh, we enter all of those overtime, special overtime, holiday overtime, um, sick time, vacation time. We do all the payroll in our office. And then we handle all our personnel issues, mostly in our office at our level, and then we send the ones we can't handle up here to the HR department. So this, the three people in that department, in this little office do a lot of little work. Mandy Shaw. I'm glad to hear you have a process for processing the citizen work requests and all, no matter how they come in um, and the resident work requests, but how do you, what's your process for actually communicating back to the residents that filed them that either something is being done or not being done or has been done. Um, I know my own personal experience, but many others is you send an email and then you never hear anything. Um, or you file that C-click fix, not everyone does use that system. So, but, but so how, do, how do you communicate back with the individuals that file the requests? So sometimes it's by email, sometimes it's by a personal phone call, sometimes it's actually by people showing up to actually investigate. So it all depends on the type of thing Type, type of request and what's going on. Um, and it also, some of them do get lost. We are trying to correct that. Some get, go into the black hole of Neverland. Um, if you call in a pothole request, almost definitely you're not gonna get a call back. It goes into the work, work, workflow. They go do it or they don't do it. If it doesn't get done, you call back. We keep pushing it out to them and they keep putting it on their list and doing it. Um, those are things we have to work a little better at and hopefully the dude solution thing will allow us to do that. We, um, there is a disconnect between C-Click Fix and there's a little disconnect there we're trying to resolve. So there is work still being done on that. Um, this is actually a question for Mr. Bachman. When we do the town audit, since this is a department that is largely self-contained, are they sampled like everybody else or how are they handled? Well. They do a lot of their own work, but all the, all the financial work comes into this building and is okay. done in this building. So it is audited just like any other department. Okay, thank you. There are things that we, they come to us and audit our process for how we get it to this building. Because we do receive money in the building. Right. <clears throat> so they do come look at how we handle our money and they make sure we handle it correctly and get it transferred to this building correctly. That's the biggest part of the audit that we see. Thank but, you. Yes, Dorothy. Um, I just wanted to comment that on a very big um, sewer job that was at my house this summer, uh, that um, the professionals who had to do the work never were delayed by the town. I mean, whenever permits, and there's, there were permits and inspections every step of the way, and they just happened time, just seamlessly. So that was very good. just want to compliment you. Thank you. You had a very good contractor then. <laughs> we, 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 we are... Well, the next group is engineering, and that's who handles those type of things. Once the permit's issued by administrative staff, the engineers will do the inspections. And um, the good contractors will talk to us and keep us informed, and we'll be right on top of it. The, problem, the ones we have problems with are the contractors who don't want to talk to us, and we never know what's going on. So if you do hire a contractor, anybody who's listening to this, um, if they talk to us, the more they talk to us, the smoother the process goes. The least amount you talk to us, the harder it goes. All right, I have 10 minutes, and I'm going to talk about engineering. Um, engineering, five people, town engineer, assistant town engineer, engineering technician, utility technician, and environmental scientist. The environmental scientist, is she's the newest person on our team. 
She just got her, she just passed her PE, so she's actually now a licensed engineer. Um, we're actually very, we've worked very hard to get very qualified and well-trained people. Um, it it's, helps us out a great deal. So we actually have now four PEs in the overall department. Myself, Amy, town engineer and environmental scientist. And then we have one person who may be working on getting their PE as well. Um, we'll see how he does. Um, so these are the things we do. The engineering office prepares all the plans and specifications and manages almost everything we do in the contracting world. They supervise our work, we provide support to the town, uh, we supply port support to all the divisions that have permits. Lindsay, who's our environmental scientist, she coordinates all the sampling and all the permits that have to be done and coordinated for water, wastewater, and solid waste division. She also jumps in and does other things such as stormwater, we're, getting re we're going to get a stormwater permit here soon. We applied for it. She's coordinating all the permitting for that. This division handles most of that stuff. The engineers in the division also provide the field work and the plans that are needed for some of these things as well. So uh, we submitted an NOI for a project down the road for actually it's well four. We're putting in a generator there. We had to submit a NOI to the conservation department. We prepared that and it's this group that does these things. Um, we do use consultants, and this group manages the consultants. Right now, these are the four main consultants we use, and we're using a surveyor, uh, with two different surveyors. We're using Berkshire Design Group as a surveying company, and we're using uh, an eastern, eastern land surveying, I think it is, northeastern land surveying. This is where they kind of consider. We use the consultants for very technical stuff that we, the generalist, don't do on an everyday basis, and it would take us longer to go back and figure out how to do it. We've done it, but it would take us longer to figure it out than to keep doing their normal stuff. We don't use the consultants for basic stuff. We design our own water lines, sewer lines, and road repair projects in-house. That's basic. We do that every day. Um, we're up to speed on that. Trying to decide what to do in the wastewater treatment plant. We don't do that every day. We don't see new technologies, which the CDM is working on wastewater treatment plants around the nation and around the world. They see what other people are doing to upgrade their plants, and they bring that information in and evaluate it based on what we need to do. Tate and Howard does all our water system at this time. They have come in. They do our model, run our water model. They also look at different facilities, and they know how different facilities are doing. They are basically in the Northeast in Florida. Um, a lot of people in the Northeast have offices in Florida. I haven't figured that one out yet. <laughs> um, so we do use tie and bond for dam inspections. And yes, they're dam inspections. And landfill, they, they've been involved in the landfill since they were first started, so we keep them on board because they know they have a lot of history at that. Weston and Samson's a newer, newer uh, group that's working with us. We start, started them with a DPW building, and now they're doing a survey on the fountain down in uh, Sweetser Park. So engineering puts together all the road repair plans. We have a pavement management system we use. It's called StreetScan. The actual program they call it is Pavimon. So the StreetScan vehicle comes out, scans, the, gets, collects the data, and they put it into this program called Pavimon. And out comes what we should be doing. And roughly, we have basically a $28 million backlog of road repairs. It's not actually the true cost, because when we start looking at a road repair, we start looking also at uh, water and sewer infrastructure in the ground and repairing those things. Because if we're going to pave the road, we're not going to leave a broken manhole. We're not going to leave uh, a section of water main pipe that needs to be replaced underneath a brand new road so they can break later and mess up everything. So we do a complete analysis. So a road project, even though it may say in the Pavimon that it's $2 million, it may be two and a half after we do all that extra stuff we want to do. Um, then again, engineering, this is kind of a sample. We can design just about anything. We can make nice, as the middle one says, nice little architectural type drawings. Um, the left. The left drawing is the repaving of Coles, Coles Lane. Um, that's the, the right is the sidewalk in front of Sweetser Park we just did. 
Those are the things we design, we supervise. Consultants did the two projects on both sides. Um, the one in the middle is a concept, has not been really gone very far. Um, the top picture with the backhoe, that's our crews working on our design on Pine Street. We did not hire anybody to design Pine Street. We did it all in-house. Uh, we did the design. We did a good part of the construction. We used a, consult a contractor for the heavy construction. The uh, bottom parking lot, we designed the parking lot at Amity Street, went through all the permitting, which everyone has to go through, got it approved, and then we had a contractor build it. Warner Brothers built that. The, uh, the one on the far right is another concept which hasn't, isn't, is not going to go anywhere, but it's a concept. We can do concept plans and figure out what we think and then decide if we need to go somewhere else. We, will, we don't design roundabouts. We hire somebody else because there's a lot of modeling that goes into designing a roundabout, which we don't have the software to do. And it would be very expensive for us to gear up to do that. So we use a consultant for that type of work. We only have a brief five minutes. Um, I want to start with a comment. And obviously, I have an advantage of having worked um, with the DPD, DPW for a number of years through my um, chairing the DPW Fire Station Advisory Committee. And one of the issues that has come up regularly is other people see other towns and they say, oh, this town just built a DPW for X amount of dollars. And then when you look at that DPW, they realize they do about one-tenth of what our DPW does. And so doing comparables for DPW for Amherst is extremely difficult. We've had at least two people, one on the committee and one not on the committee, attempt that. So down the road as we get to the issue of big capital projects of which DPW, which is in a building that's 100 years old, uh, and you would not want to work there, um, is uh, really an issue of how do you find a comparable? Because as you've just seen, just about anything you as a homeowner or a renter want to do that deals with the streets, the trees, et cetera, is under this department. So it is extraordinarily comprehensive and a big issue to tackle. Other comments, questions? Mandy Jo. I have one about the street scan. That created a list. Obviously, you got an estimate from that list. Do you publish sort of your five-year plan or your one-year plan on which streets are going to get done when or where they might be at this time? I know that might change depending on things, but, but so that residents could see, oh, you know, this street is graded here and it's five years out. My street's graded less, so I'm seven years out. You know, do you publish that? The, the list doesn't really get published until we actually decide what the list is for that year, and then it gets published. You can go online into the website, and you can go to your street and see what your street's rated as. You can also go to your neighbor's street and see what they're rated as. Um, so you can compare your streets and um, online, but the list is very fluid and changes quite a bit. Um, we thought we had a good list for this year. I'm not sure we'll be able to do it, a lot of stuff will maybe get pushed down. Um, and then again, we have a lot of work left over from last year we're going to start the spring with. Yes, George. Aside from a new facility, I'm wondering what's on your wish list? What is, what is your biggest need? What would you like to have that you don't have other than the facility? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, Actually, the biggest issue we're coming up to besides the, the changes we're going to have to make to our facility in water and wastewater is personnel changes. Um, it's getting very, the personnel market right now is very, very tight. Um, and you look on, you, you, you all get the beacon now, don't you? Look at the back in the publications of what they're advertising for. You'll see communities advertising for truck drivers now in the beacon. They're advertising for water operators in the beaking. Usually it was only professionals you advertised in those type of publications. We're having a hard time finding people, and we're actually having to spend a lot of time growing people. 
So we bring people in who are interested in being in the community, and we give them the resources to grow themselves into the job. And, and that's something that, one, you're not hiring someone who really knows all the pieces they need to know to begin with, so you're a little bit behind the curve. As they grow and they learn things, they become some of the best operators you got. But then you have to keep them. As we grow operators, we're a lot like the police and the fire department. We make good people, and then other people are looking for them too. I actually expected I was going to lose two employees to South Deerfield. I kind of expected they'd want to go get more money. Um, they actually chose the work environment we have over going to get more money in a work environment that was a little unknown to them. That's good. Those are our challenges. Growing employees, keeping them in a, in, in, inter, interactive, and keeping them focused on be, working for them. That's our biggest. And then Amy wants something. <laughs> Well, and I think when Guilford was talking about um, the electrical division, as we call them, I think that, you know, that illustrates that sometimes taking a service that we contract out, if, if we're just relying on them a ton, um, bringing them in-house just ends up working out so much better. Um, so we actually, you know, we are on our ultimate wish list. We do want a programmer to do all of that SCADA programming and all of that stuff. And, you know... I know every department has what they want, but I guess that's that's the number one one on my lit, wish list is to have someone in-house that can do programming rather than having to bring a consultant out um, every time we have to do that, especially since when we do have to bring someone in, they're getting the really big projects and there's, you know, the little, the little maintenance stuff, you know, like something being misspelt on a screen that you're not gonna bring someone in to do that and it's probably just gonna be misspelt the entire time until we have someone that can just deal with some of those little um, little issues as well, so. So uh, looking at our time, we wanna thank Guilford and Amy for this excellent presentation. Uh, Mr. Bachman. Yes, so I just wanted to recognize, we part of this is to show you our talented staff. So Guilford and Amy are both uh, professional engineers. Amy is just uh, is the president of the Mass Waterworks Association recently elected, uh, seen as, as one of the premier um, people in that inner field. And um, Guilford has extensive experience through military, working in Northampton, working in the South. And so they just bring a, a wealth of experience to our operations, and we're really fortunate to have them uh, here. And it really comes to um, evident, it becomes very evident when there's a crisis. So when we had lead in the water at the schools um, two years ago, uh, Amy, along with others, was in the forefront. When we have a, any kind of water crisis or um, any other thing that happens, you know, Guilford is there on, on key weekends, uh, and they're just there 24 hours a day. So we're really fortunate to have you guys uh, part of our team. So, Thank you. Um, we're going to take about a three-minute break. <laughs> because we do have the school superintendent and the financial person from the schools here, okay? I just wanna mention as we are all getting reassembled that we do have a period put aside for public comment. I'll be asking who wants to make public comment, but that is at the end of the agenda. The real purpose of this meeting is to educate 13 people either now or by video, okay? <laughs> So, um, would you like me to just call directly on the superintendent of schools? Sure. Superintendent Morris, Mike. Thank you, and thanks for having us. I'm here with Sean, Mon I'm uh, Mike Morris, I'm the superintendent. I'm here with Sean Mangano, our finance director. Uh, Doreen. Can you get closer to the mic? I can. Ours are the opposite way in our venue, so I get told the opposite, you know, the other thing. Uh, the Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources, Equity and Diversity wanted to be here but wasn't able to with her scheduling this morning, so she, sended her, she sent her regrets. Um, I want to start actually by making connection to the previous presentation. So uh, Amy, who you, you just met with, uh, and I were in touch at about 4.15 this morning about the weather, uh, trying to figure out if we needed to have a delay of school. And I, I tell that story because it's emblematic of how uh, we experience working with the town at the school level. Our, our goals and needs are integ integral and integrated. Um, we can't know what the roads are like unless the DPW is communicating to us how that's going. I could then pick other town departments, police department, um, the library, all the ways that the schools um, connect often and benefit from working with the other town departments. So I know we're gonna talk about schools, but I also wanted to start from a place of, you're seeing these kind of uh, siloed 
presentations is my guess. Um, and in reality, we don't function as silos. We really do work together. And, and the town manager is a great support in assisting us and creating those connections so that we're all working for the residents of Amherst Young and less young. Um, you. So I start with the slide um, from our graduation because it's, uh, if any of you can attend this year, it's Friday, June 7th at the Mullen Center at five o'clock. Uh, it's a sincere invitation that we want to reach out to you that if you'd like to attend, we strongly encourage it. It's about the best 90 minutes you can experience that gives you the taste of our district. It's not exactly the typical high school graduation uh, that, that I experienced or that many of us did. It's very Amherst. Um, and so we really encourage you to come uh, and join us. We'll, we'll be sending RSVPs, we'll, you know, we'll get a little closer to June. But uh, the reason I want to start here is you see so many students uh, talk about their experiences. One of our traditions is that uh, for all the elementary schools and middle school that feed into us, including Leverett and Shutesbury, an educator from one of those schools, one of those sites, joins the graduation. And it's amazing to see uh, six foot four inch 18 uh, year olds come up and uh, greet their first grade teacher from Leverett and say, oh my God, you are so helpful in me getting to this place. And, and that's the way we really build that, even though we are three districts, which we'll talk about in a little bit, we really function as one learning community. Um, and it's a great event, so you really should think about attending if you're able. Um, so just a quick one on highlights. Um, we, our rankings in, in all sorts of ways continue to rise. Uh, this year we were ranked as the number one best place to teach in Massachusetts, the best school district in the Western Massachusetts, and ninth best in Massachusetts more generally uh, for students. That's up from kind of in the you know, 15 and then 11, we've had this positive trajectory uh, on a number of ratings. On a functional level, we see that in school choice. School choice is a program in Massachusetts where students who don't reside in a member community can apply if there's space to join that district. And what we've noticed over the last couple of years is a significant uptick in school choice interest. These are students coming, living in member communities, uh, but wanting to enroll in the Amherst Public Schools or the Amherst Pelham Regional Schools or the Pelham, Regional, Pelham Public School because of the reputation and the education that our educators are able to offer them. The breadth of offerings uh, and the quality of education is, are the two things that continue to come out as why students want to get into our school district. So governance, um, you've seen this slide before if you attended the summer event uh, that the town manager put on, but I, I thought now that you're in different roles, probably worth going over a little bit. Uh, actually, I wanna note that there's gonna be two places before the end where we'll stop for questions, and then certainly we'll have questions at the end, but we know there's a lot of content, even though not a tremendous number of slides, so we, we wanted to build in places, and uh, we're gonna start with governance and finance. We'll then talk about our students and our staff, and then we'll finish with some highlights across the curricular areas. So in terms of governance, uh, we have, uh, both Sean and I work for three elementary, three districts, excuse me, three school districts. Only two are represented here. The Amherst Public Schools, which is a pre-K to six district for all students in the town of Amherst. There's three elementary schools. Crocker Farm has the district-wide preschool. Fort River and Wildwood are both K to six schools. You can see the number of students who attend those schools at the current moment. Sean and I also both work for the Pelham Public School. That's not on here, it's not connected to the Amherst Public School, except for that asterisk. So a couple years ago, uh, we proposed and town meetings of both communities supported the formation of a regional school district planning board to assess the feasibility and desirability of regionalizing, um, in this case with Pelham and, and kind of vice versa for Pelham with Amherst. And that group has met, I think, 25, 26 times. Uh, they've been meeting uh, every other week for a long period of time now. Uh, they're at the point where they're working on getting real financial figures and real um, sort of governance models. Uh, these topics are coming up to both elementary school committees in Amherst and Pelham, uh, and there's a plan for broader community engage in, engagement in coming months. Um, the Amherst Pelham Regional Schools are our 7 through 12 regional school district for students in Amherst, Leverett, Pelham, and Shutesbury. Uh, right now we have three secondary schools, the middle school, the high school, and Summit Academy. Summer Academy is a day program for students with special needs who benefit from having a smaller, uh, more therapeutic environment. This year it moved from its own site to now actually it's within the high school building. It's still its own school with its own entrance and own kind of from a DESE, our state licensing agency, it has its own uh, model, but uh, we found some true benefits of integration of students um, as students and families desire to have that program in our high school. It also saved significant uh, financial resources in maintaining a building that was outdated on Southeast Street. Um, so that's been a successful transition. 
Um, we can talk a little uh, budget and then we'll stop for questions. I know these are all trying to balance the time frame we have and the amount of information uh, that we're sharing. So I'll turn it over to Sean who will do a budget overview. Hello. So FY19 was a good example of a budget year where we turn challenges into opportunities. Um, we had some significant challenges around health insurance. Um, but out of that, we've made some really um, smart decisions that are putting us in a good place for next year's budget. Um, but I'll focus on FY19 for right now. So you can see our FY19 budgets for each uh, Amherst Public Schools and the Amherst Pelham Regional Schools. Uh, the public schools had a 3.2% increase. That's a little larger than usual because of the health insurance premiums went up quite a bit for FY19. Uh, the major investment that we made in FY19 at, at the elementary level was for ELL. Um, we increased, I think, the sections of ELL for students um, and also had to add some coordination. Um, and that's driven by the number of ELL students that we have. Um, the major challenge, which is the same for both the public schools and the region, is the health insurance. Um, our premiums went up about 25% from FY18 to FY19. At the regional level, we had a 1.6% increase, which is more typical of what we uh, see at the regional level. Um, we have to work with four towns, Amherst, Pelham, Lever, and Shutesbury, so we have to put together a budget that um, can be supported in all four of those communities. Our major investment there was for to expand our Chinese language program. Um, we compete directly with schools in the area, charter schools, other public schools, um, and we have a very strong Chinese program, but it was missing one section to make it a complete program, um, and so we added that section, and I think we feel pretty good about where our Chinese program is right now. Um, and, yeah, can I add to that piece, uh, Sean? So I think the other thing to note is this came from families um, coming from, uh, in many ways, coming from a charter school who wanted to come to the public schools and facilitated, we facilitated meetings at their request about what their needs were because some of the students were having a significantly different model of education at their elementary school experience and how could we meet their needs if they wanted to transition to the public school experience. So this really was driven by families telling us um, what their needs were and trying to meet it so that um, students who were in our home district could return to the public schools, because that was their desire, but they needed to make sure that their continued exploration of Chinese would continue at the secondary level. Right. Um, and we also put all of our resources online. So if you go to that link, which is a little funny, but it brings you to the ARPS website, um, you can find our budget presentations, which are like two or 300 page documents if you like to read and look at lots of charts and information. Um, we also put our four town meeting presentations, which are the, the meetings for Leverett, Pelham, Shutesbury, and Amherst for the regional level. Um, we put quarterly budget reports that we make to school committee um, after each quarter, which kind of gives a progress update on the, the current year. Push the button, gotta get used to that. Um, we put our audit reports, so if you wanna see our past audit reports, um, OPEB, which will be an issue you'll have to deal with, our OPEB reports are up there. Um, so we try to put all of our financial information up there. Um, if you ever look and you don't see something, you can email me or Mike and, and let us know and we'll get it up there. So one of the measures that we look at to see how successful sort of the school is doing um, is our tuition out numbers um, for charter choice and vote because those are really sort of the other educational opportunities that uh, families can make in the area. And we have quite a few of them. So we have, um, we have a lot of high pu quality public school programs around us, um, just neighboring towns. We have three charter schools that are within distance that we send kids to. And we have three vocational schools that are within distance that kids go to. So um, there's a lot of choices for families. Um, and so this chart shows Amherst, which is the dotted blue line. It's actually Amherst, Pelham, Lever, and Shutesbury K through 12. Uh, compared to our neighboring towns and what percentage of our students go to a charter school or a uh, choice into another public school. Vocational is not included here because vocational isn't, the, the data is not available online for all the schools. So you can see all the communities have been trending upward lately because there's been expanding charter schools in the area. Um, but for the first time since this chart was put together, um, Amherst went down for FY18 and we're seeing that trend continue for FY19. So we've flattened out in terms of the percentage of students who are leaving and we're actually seeing students come back in. And this chart also illustrates that. So this includes just the Amherst numbers um, and it also includes vocational. So vocational is green, choice is red, and blue is charter and it's the number of students K-12 that go out. So you can see there was a, a sort of an incline up through FY17. Part of that was because one of the charter schools in the area expanded um, to high school so they were adding grades every year. Um, and also the uh, Smith Vocational added some programming which drew some more kids. Um, but FY18, we saw a big drop, um, and we're seeing that flatten out for FY19. So we've, we're seeing our numbers flatten out in terms of kids leaving the district, which has a big financial impact on our budget. 
at this point. I know there was a lot of information um, that got shared with you, but we thought we'd pause and see if there are uh, at least preliminary questions on budget um, or governance uh, before we start talking about our students and staff. Questions at this point? I, I have two. For, I was under the impression when we had the Four Towns meeting that you started out last year with over a million dollars in deficit, and yet that's not what you showed. Could you explain the difference? I think this is, is this the slide you're referencing? Yes. Right, so if you look at Amherst Pelham Regional, um, you can see the reduction. That was the reduction related to health insurance, so a million twelve thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars I see, okay. And in the relationship with Pelham and the discussion with Pelham, down the road, and you may want to wait to address this, yeah. how does that fit in with our conversation about a new elementary school and the proportioning of students across elementary schools? So it's certainly something um, that the regionalization board has discussed. Um, I would say they're not at a phase where that's an active that if there's a, like a clear next step on that um, front. I also just, uh, when we think about Pelham School right now, Pelham School is uh, roughly 60% Pelham residents and 40% choice students. It's roughly, so that's only about 50, a neighborhood of 50 choice students. Um, so there's not a tremendous amount of space. And those students, once you're a choice student in, you're a choice student in. So for instance, if, you, if you're a kindergarten family and you have a student who choices in who lives in Belchertown and goes to Pelham Elementary, you're guaranteed a slot there all the way through the end of Pelham Elementary, actually all the way through 12th grade within mm -hmm. our district. So I think any implication for kind of enrollment would be relatively minor and play out over many years. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, let's move on. Okay. Sure. So we're gonna talk, talk about our favorite topic, which is our students. Um, so this is the Wildwood Elementary School Chorus, and I think it's just, it's a nice visual representation of the diversity that our students bring to our school and the great benefit that we get uh, as a district for having such a diverse demographic. We're one of very few districts, there's about three, that whose um, demographics in terms of race, ethnicity, special education, um, socioeconomic status, um, and English language learner status mirror pretty closely the state average, which I'm gonna editorialize a little bit, is really sad. If you think of the state mean, you would expect many districts to represent the, the, what the state averages are, but because of residential segregation, lots of other factors, it's actually very few districts that actually are microcosms of the Commonwealth. Um, so we're really fortunate, and for me and for us, that's a great opportunity um, that we take very seriously uh, in terms of how we integrate our students and how they feel connected with one another and in in our organization. So this is for the Amherst Public Schools, not the region, because that draws students from other, um, the other three communities. So if you look at who our students are, um, roughly a quarter of them, uh, their first language is not English. We have uh, over 30 languages spoken among our elementary school population. And that's a wonderful benefit, and it's also a challenge. How do we staff that? How do we support students, particularly in low incidence languages, right? So Spanish, Chinese, some of our more common first languages of our students, they're relatively easy to make sure we have staffing for. Um, I recently had students come, and I'm not gonna identify it, because it would be identifying for the students, but it's a language where there are incredibly few residents of Massachusetts who speak that language, let alone residents of Western Massachusetts. So uh, as much as it's a benefit from a financial and staffing perspective, it creates some challenges that you know, we try to our best to meet, and I think we do um, our best good faith effort to do that, uh, but, but it can be challenging. You could see that we have a slightly higher than average students with disabilities percentage, and you know some of that from what families tell us is because we do right by students with disabilities. We provide resources and supports uh, that they need to access the curriculum, and one of the things that happens in any market is if you're seen to be particularly good at something, more people come. And while that's a wonderful thing, we want the diversity, neuro neurodevelopmental diversity within our schools, it, you know, doing the right thing can get challenging as there's more and more students or a higher percentage of students with disabilities. Um, and economic disadvantage, you can see we're very aligned with the state average. Um, it's a big surprise to many people. When they think about Amherst, they don't necessarily think about these numbers. Um, you know, to think of 33%, and just to describe economically disadvantaged for a second, that's students who are on food stamps or other public assistance. That's not the, like in the old model where we got free and reduced lunch, 
That's actually not the model that the state uses now. These are students who, um, the families are known because of other government resources that go to them. So SNAP, which is what kind of food stamps are called right now. Um, so our free reduced lunch numbers are actually significantly higher than the 33.4. They're over 40%. Uh, but since the state uses this metric, it's the one that we use as well. I, th I think they're going to make their presentation, and then we'll ask yeah. questions. Yeah, I think we'll just do a slide or two at it, or two or three slides, and then we can stop. This is another slide. Thanks to the, the. Thankfully, I didn't have to create this one. It's very nice. It's more like Sean's uh, variety of neat slides than mine. But this was actually created by the. Uh, we had an enrollment working group over the past few years to look at our enrollment challenges, and this looks at our enrollment distribution by race, ethnicity again at the elementary level. And one of the things you notice is that um, this goes back 20 years that some of the groups stay, uh, ethnic racial groups stay pretty constant, uh, while other groups have significant uh, differences, not challenges, excuse me, differences. Um, so you look, our fastest growing demographic is Latino, Hispanic, or Hispanic students, I call Latino, but the state uses Hispanic. I feel really weird actually having that on a slide, but perhaps a conversation for a different day. Um, it's worth noting that you know, some of these, like the multiracial slide you could, uh, category only came up in 2006, so that, can skew some of the data a little bit because DESE didn't collect that prior to that, to fiscal year 06. Um, but this slide, if you, if I asked the average Massachusetts resident, plot out what Amherst public school students race ethnicity is, I doubt they would have this, um, this slide. And for us, again, incredible benefit, incredible opportunity. Uh, we love the diversity and we uh, value that and it makes all of our students, there's lots of evidence in the educational setting Diversity only engenders creative thinking and the type of problem solving that we want for our students. Um, so it's an exciting trend for us, um, but it's a surprise to many people, uh, particularly as it doesn't mirror the larger Amherst community. Um, and I think we're like many communities in Massachusetts where our student, our young, the demographics of our young people is very different than the, young, the demographics of the town as a whole. And um, that's an opportunity for us, but it's something that um, is surprising to many. I think I'll just do one or two on staff and then we can stop for another round of questions. So the reason the whole operation works is that we have incredible staff members, incredible educators in our schools. Um, they come from local places. Some are graduates of our district, which is always neat. Uh, some come from far away places and some, like me, just come from New York, which is not that far away but not that local as well. Um, but people come because of our environment. You know, that ranking that I shared at the beginning is because teachers feel supported uh, in the work and uh, they really love working with our demographic of students. Uh, the vast majority have advanced degrees in their discipline, they're highly talented, and many awards and honors go to our staff members, both local and beyond, because of recognition of their work. One of the major focuses of our school committee over the past few years, uh, for many years, I should say, uh, has been the diversity of our staff and how do, since we have this shift in our students, how do we increase the diversity of our staff? Uh, I think it's worth noting that our students roll through every year through our schools. Our staff, um, as I'll mention in, in a bit, mostly stays here because they like it, which is a good thing. The challenge with that is it's hard to make uh, dents in diversity, um, changes in diversity of staffing when not many people are leaving because it means you're not hiring all that many people. Uh, but we've been very successful the last three years. Um, so the percentage of professional staff members of color has increased over a third in the last three years to the current, which is over a quarter of our staff, professional staff identifies as, as uh, people of color, which is in the top five of districts in Massachusetts and is number one outside the Boston area. And our administrative staff is even higher than that, uh, just about a third, a little over a third of our administrative team are people of color, and that's also a significant increase from a few years prior. Um, last slide on staff and students. Um, one of the things that we know is that the world's changing, education's changing, and we need to support our staff to do that. So I just, I was gonna do a slide of all the PD that we do, and it was like four point font and really not helpful, so I decided to do a snapshot of, a, uh, of staff development that we did, because I think it's indicative of the way we approach this task of how do we support all staff members. It's worth noting that all staff members were invited to this, even some of our staff who don't typically work on professional development days uh, were invited, so we had a significant group of paraeducators, custodians, food service staff members uh, in this workshops, and our, our theme in the morning was equity and diversity. Um, these are the workshops that were offered. It was, um, they came from two sources. One, we survey staff to say what are the needs, what are you struggling with, and how can we support you? 
Uh, and most of these workshops were led by staff members. I led the one implicit bias in the process of unbiasing. Uh, most of them were led by uh, educators closer to the staff level as opposed to administrators. There were a few that we did pull in local faculty members from colleges and universities, but this wasn't everyone gets together in the auditorium for three hours and listens to a lecture. Uh, actually, everyone did get together in the auditorium for about 25 minutes and they listened to high school students describe their, how they experience schools. And then we broke out, um, and many of these, even these breakout workshops, had high school students and middle school students involved in them as well. Uh, we know we want to respond to all of our students, and we know that right now, despite our best efforts, not every student um, feels as connected as we want in the community as well as the school district, and that's our effort of how to do that well, both on the academic level as well as the social emotional piece. So now I think- Now we, we want to pause something. for questions, Dorothy. I just wondered if uh, on the uh, chart that you had of, of um, the different uh, levels, I guess, um, disabilities and high needs, if yeah. you could talk about that a little bit. What sure. That means. Yeah. So high needs is a sort of composite of English language learners, special education, and or education, uh, excuse me, economically disadvantaged students. The state has this way of clumping them to make a kind of meta category of students who across the state are underserved. In, school populations, so that's what that um, term means. In terms of students with disabilities, we follow kind of, you know, about the law, but ethically as well, that when there are concerns either expressed by a family member or um, the school or at the, the secondary level, even by a student themselves, that we evaluate them with licensed psychologists, um, special education teachers, depending on the need, um, occupational therapists, physical therapists, to assess whether they have a disability that is um, making it difficult for the student to access, fully access the curriculum. If they do have disabilities, then we identify those, uh, the programs that they need and we deliver those services. There's annual reviews every year to assess progress and a full reevaluation every three years to see if the disability is, is still impacting the uh, student's access to the curriculum. One of the things that we pride ourselves in is that we have in-district special education programs. So we have, relative to other districts, very few students who attend out-of-district placements. Uh, both there's, there's some financial savings in that, even though it doesn't always, it appears differently. So we have, uh, what it looks like is we have beefed up special ed staffing and very low out of district costs. The reality is there's some wash between those things, but we feel like we have to do our honest best to say if a student can be educated locally, we want to educate them locally. We want them with their peers, not just for that student's benefit, but we feel like for students who are neuro neurodevelopmentally typical, they benefit from having the broad access to the diverse neurodevelopmental diversity for our population. What we know is that if students first see someone with significant disability at age 18 or 21 or only in the community, not in the school, uh, that's not a great model. We've done that model for a long time in the United States, and we know that that leads to a lot of discrimination about, for folks with disabilities um, in the larger community. And so we feel like as a school district, our commitment is to change that dynamic, both for the students with disabilities, but actually for the broader community of learners as well. Well, you're on the disability chart. Please. Many people would suggest that a lot of the diversity that you're depicting here is because of the higher ed institutions versus people who just choose to move to Amherst for other reasons. What would be your split on the percentage of that? Yeah, so um, the majority of our students are not uh, children of faculty of faculty members at the university. Students. Oh, most of our students. Yeah. Most of them are children. Of, are not. Are not children yeah. of students. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the vast majority, you know, um, are not. And um, I think as it relates to poverty, I think we see some. So I used to get I've gotten it less in the last few years, but a lot of questions of like, well, are your economically disadvantaged numbers higher because you have kind of the quote unquote starving graduate student model, um, that's a really small percentage of our students. Um, and particularly as with this new economically disadvantaged versus free reduced lunch, it's, it really doesn't come out much in these numbers. You know, we have families who that certainly, we, we do have that demographic, but the majority of our families who are econ struggling economically are struggling economically, you know, without like long-term prospects of, well, I get this degree and all of a sudden I'm on a high paying job in two years. These are families who, um, whose parents, uh, for a whole host of reasons, didn't move on into higher education um, and have advanced degrees. Um, that, that's more typically what we see in terms of economically disadvantaged. I think that's industry. a commonly misunderstood issue in Amherst. I appreciate you raising it. Yeah. Yes, Mandy Jo. So I think you've touched on this a little bit, but maybe not directly. So I know 
with my past service on town meeting and a whole bunch of things with budget, a lot of people say we have a very high per pupil cost, both, both in the elementary schools and in the regional schools. Can you speak to what the district might be doing that causes that um, or results in that yeah. compared to local other districts? Yeah. So I can start and then I'll ask Sean to jump in. So I think a couple things. One is the demographics of our school dictate that we have more students who need ELL support. They have more students who need, who, who need special education programs. Um, and, and that has financial impact uh, on our schools. We also have a community that values um, two things that are costly. One is relatively small school size, uh, class size, excuse me. So our class size at the elementary level is 19 students. That's lower than the typical average class size at this elementary level in Western Massachusetts for sure. So, you know, when we compare ourselves to other communities, could we combine sections and have classes of 25? Sure. You know, does our community demand more? They do, uh, they, and, and for good reason. I think another factor that talks, that gets at the kind of that conundrum that you say, how do you explain this, is that our community values, um, I'll call electives and, um, specials categories at, at really high levels. So for instance, if you enter our high school, the range of courses that you'll receive is very different than what I received as a student, right? So we have courses on gay and lesbian literature. Uh, we have an MSAN course, Minority Student Achievement Network, which is a broad network talking about social justice and equity um, areas. Our theater program is expansive and we're adding another course on theater uh, next year. Um, so we're not a high school where you enter and you take, okay, well, English 9, English 10, English 11, and then English 12. Uh, the vantage point of our community and the demands of our community are that we offer a much wider range of offerings for our students. And so it's, it's difficult balancing the financial realities and what the community is demanding on the other end, and we try to do our best. We have less, less um, electives than we used to. We used to offer more languages than we currently do, and, and we've had to make reductions in, the, in areas. We cut a number of electives last year in that budget process, um, family consumer science, um, and... Um, blanking on a couple others, but we've had to make those decisions. Sean can also fill in a little more details. Yeah, I'm on. Um, I think everything Mike said is correct. Um, the other thing I would say when I look at the numbers is a big chunk of our increase in per pupil spending has actually been because of declining enrollment. So having similar or slightly increased budgets but fewer kids to spread it across. Um, there, there's some costs that kind of scale down when your enrollment goes down, but there's a, a lot of costs that also stays flat. Um, you know, retiree health insurance, utilities, um, things like that. You have fewer students to spread it out over, so the per, per pupil cost goes up. Um, so the last five to 10 years, a big chunk of the increase has actually been declining enrollment. Um, not as much our budget's going up a huge amount each year. Yes, Dorothy. Um, I was trying to uh, learn more about the school system, and I noticed that you have a, a connection between the middle school and the high school. Uh, which I think is very, very high level, where students uh, who have a high academic ability can start high school courses in the middle school. Could you talk about that? Sure, we could talk a bit about that. Um, I think it's worth noting that we've tried to keep our cohorts together, so I wouldn't say that's the typical model. What we've tried to do, I'll, I'll give you like a really tangible one, because I think the general ones won't be helpful. So uh, math is an area where we often have students who Right. Uh, feel like they need additional levels of challenge. And, sorry, I'm like, it's a wider semicircle, so Straight I feel like <laughs> for the two members on the outside, I apologize. I feel like I haven't said hi to Alyssa wow. or Darcy. Um, and so um, what we've done is created a program within the middle school that in the middle of seventh grade, students can opt into our portfolio course. It meets after school. Students need to not only be, um, uh, have strong skills in mathematics, but be highly motivated uh, to do that, they, they meet after school and they have a lot of independent work that's assigned that they have to meet certain benchmarks along the way. They do that for the last year and a half of their two years in middle school and at the successful completion when they enter high school, they skip essentially what's the ninth grade math course, uh, which allows them to take calculus as a junior and then multivariable uh, mathematics as a senior, which is very rarely offered in public schools uh, in in the north that, that I'm aware of in the Northeast. Um, so that's a, a way that we've tried to be able to respond to the diverse demographics of learners that we have, uh, knowing that there are students who need extra support, which we've probably talked about more than um, some students I'm glad you raised, um, who need additional challenge on the other end of the academic continuum. Pat. 
I deeply appreciate the work it looks like you're doing around racism. Um, I wonder if you have kept statistics about discipline of students of color compared to student, white students. We have, and that's something the school committee has certainly shown an interest in, and, and we've talked about uh, last year, we, we, we talked about it at length. Uh, all that information in terms of suspensions is all public information, it's online, um, and certainly if someone's interested in the link, I can share that with you. It gives you for every district of the Massachusetts, the, the discipline disparity for uh, every district of Massachusetts, so you can compare yourself to other districts as well as the state average around that, but it's, we, it's something that we talk about frequently and we're actively working on. George. Seems that one of the biggest challenges you're facing is declining student enrollments. What do you see in the future? Um, what's the projection? So I think that'll work really well into one of the last slides, if it's okay to hold that question, because um, right. we definitely have an answer, but I think it'll, it'll meld well with the last slide. And the issue, the other national trend uh, is the whole issue of the baby boomers retiring out, and I'm sure you've started to see that, but yet your retention rate seems to be high. How are you uh, dealing with being able to continue to attract the talent you need? So we've been doing a lot more recruitment. Um, or kind of we've stepped up our efforts around that. Um, and you know, one of the things that's interesting is the reputation matters a lot, right? In any any organization, to recruit, uh, like if people come for a visit here, that's a good place to work. That mm -hmm. means a lot. And our word of mouth, we do all these kind of fancy things that I could describe, some of which cost money, and yet I. It's going to sound like a, an odd thing, but the, the thing that I think has netted the greatest gains uh, are we now, when we're doing a job posting, we send it out to all staff members and encourage them to share it to their personal and professional networks. Really simple. It's free. And I can't tell you how many applicants we get by saying, oh, yeah, I heard from my friend Lynn that, you know, she loves working at the middle school and, yeah. you know, I'm working in this other community, but I saw this job posting. Um, so I could describe some of the more technical things, and there are them, and I don't want to minimize them, but that word of mouth is invaluable. And so we've been really playing that up with staff, and they've been responding beautifully. Okay. Yeah. Move on. All right. Um, so I am conscious of time, so I'm sorry if I'm... I'll try to be briefer than I was maybe perhaps planning on the, the last section. So for elementary highlights, I think it's worth noting that all three of our elementary schools in Amherst are doing, uh, in, they're in a period of intensive planning to further identify their unique identities. Uh, certainly the one that's getting a lot of public attention is that uh, the school committee has approved and DESE just approved about five days ago, uh, the adoption of a dual language program that will start in kindergarten next year at Fort River. We're really thrilled about it, and I am, actually, I'm going to take their time to read the mission statement, because I think it's worth reading. This was developed by uh, families um, and parents, who are, or parents, uh, guardians, and staff who are on a leadership team. I'll read it in English, because my Spanish pronunciation is not uh, the finest, um, but it's do done both languages. The Fort River Dual Language Program celebrates and integrates the cultures of all of our students, families, and staff. The Dual Language Program appreciates, nurtures, and challenges all of our individual students to reach their fullest potential as learners and global citizens. The dual language program promotes equity by developing bilingual and biliterate students prepared for economic and social leadership in our community and world. I happen to like that a lot, and I think it gives you a much better flavor than um, anything else I could share about that. Um, Crocker Farm and Wildwood are actively working on their identity uh, and will bring back proposals in the spring for the school committee to consider. Mm -hmm. Um, the middle, uh, the right slide, the right images um, are uh, part of our garden program. So one of the larger themes has been the integration of whole child education in our elementary schools. That we want students not just learning in the classroom, but actually doing what authentic garden, you know, professionals would do. And that applies to math and other areas as well. Just the pictures of the garden is a little cuter than the pictures of what that would look like perhaps in some of the other content areas. But when we're teaching social studies, we want our students to be historians and do the age-appropriate task that a historian would do, uh, not read through a textbook, which is not what a historian would actually do. Um, the middle image is from the art classroom, but I think it's indicative of uh, another major focus has been uh, a growth mindset, developing a growth mindset for our students. Not, I'm good at math, I'm bad at reading, things like that. It's that the effort um, is really the, what we focus our attention on. And that benefits not just students who are struggling, but what we see and, and research would indicate many students, what happens to many students is uh, for students who don't find incredible challenge early on in education, they get the sense that their identity is wrapped up in their test score or what they do and not about their work. And then they hit a certain place and they have struggle and they say, well, I'm not good at math anymore instead of 
I need to work hard in math or I need to learn differently in mathematics. And really changing the mindset of both our staff and our students has been intentional focus over the past few years. So the art example is, again, doing multiple drafts, not just I did the project and I'm done. The process is equally as important as the product at the end when we're talking about young students. And so uh, there's a, a, this comes from a larger video and, and series, which I won't talk about right now, but this came from Wildwood's art class. But the idea is you're doing multiple drafts, learning about it, and improving throughout the method, uh, <coughs> throughout the process. Can I say something? Please. Um, and just on our school garden program, we've done a lot in the last couple of years, um, at least once or twice a year now that uh, the students actually harvest the, um, the produce or the crop and serve it in the school lunch program. Um, so I know we did it once last year. I think they're going to try to do it twice this year, fall and spring. Uh, but we'll let you know if you want to stop by and try it out. So. I had the vegetable soup this fall. It was yeah. outstanding. Yeah. So um, yeah, um, maybe we'll have time to talk about food service briefly as we go. At the secondary level, uh, the image, I guess there's a pointer here. Right. Oh, cool. At the top left, um, it was the Puerto Rican um, independence uh, flag raising event um, that I know some of you attended uh, in November. And so the reason that image is on here is those are our middle school student leaders. Uh, who are raising the flag. Um, it used to be the town sort of owned the event, the schools took on owning the event this year. <clears throat> and for us, that's also uh, representative of our focus on student leadership. So at every level from seven through 12, you'll see student leadership um, as being a key part of our schools. Uh, even when it's responding to difficult incidents, I've been in multiple conversations this year uh, with students and they're telling us what they need and they're taking the lead on uh, how that goes. Um, you might have read in the paper, we sometimes have student protests and the reason that students feel comfortable coming and doing that is they work with the administration on how to do that successfully. It's not a, uh, that's how we approach working with our students. We want them to be advocates, we want them to be passionate, and we want them learning. And, and we've been able to find the right balance for that. Um, we have a, a strong focus on, on extracurriculars. You know, there's a picture of our Western Mass winning girls cross country team. We also could have put the boys cross country team because they also won the Western Mass championship. Um, but it's not just athletics. We have an incredible drama program, which I'll speak in a second, about clubs. Um, it, it's amazing what students do after 2.15 in the afternoon uh, sometimes feels equally important to students and equally amazing as what they do during the school day. Uh, Right after this, or soon after this, I'll be actually high school students interviewing me, and then I'm going to film an Amherst Media segment uh, with a student and the director of our high school, which produced the Laramie Project. So, incredibly poignant tale. This was the, we were the first school in the country um, to do this as an immersive theater uh, incident, this or not incident, immersive theater experience for for spectators. Um, and the feedback we received was that it was a moving experience for all who participated, both the students who supported their fellow students who were in it, as well as the larger community. Um, and what you'll notice is that our student performances tackle major social justice issues. So this doesn't seem notable. Uh, we have to be a little aware if there was going to be people who weren't so happy we were doing it there. But other than that, it's, it's very consistent with our, our work. There's a technical aspect of the theater performance, but there's also the broader kind of social emotional development and, and social justice elements in all of that. And, and lastly, I'll, talk, I'll give a little bit of data on academic achievement, because we're a school system, we should do that, right? Um, so advanced placement, we had 152 students, which is roughly a third of juniors and seniors, took at least one AP exam in 2018. 83% of those students scored three or higher, which is essentially what you can opt out of, of course, when you get to higher education. At most institutions, we boast 18 AP scholars, 14 AP scholars with honors, and eight AP scholars with distinctions. Our students receive national honors from the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards at the state level. Um, our students were added, awarded five gold keys, four silver keys, and ten honorable mentions, which is part of this art um, competition, which is amazing for one school. That would be like a region of the state, but that's just us. Uh, our print and online newspaper, The Graphic, won the highest achievement award for the New England Scholastic Press Association for four, the fourth year in a row. Um, Every year on average, last year was seven, we had six to eight high school student musicians are selected for the Allstate Music Festival. If you like seeing music, you should see our student musicians. The first time I went to one, I couldn't believe it wasn't a university level, whether it's the chorale or it's the orchestra or the band, they're just incredible. Um, our theater company was awarded the 2018 Samuel Minow Jones Award for literary contributions, and that was through uh, the library, again, another connection with town departments. In the sciences, our high school Jets Engineering Club entered nine teams, which is a total of 70 students, in the national test of engineering you know, that they put on. 
and we won overall best in the state at the ninth and 10th and 11th and 12th grade levels because it separates out um, the underclassmen from the upperclassmen. At World Languages from 2017 National Latin Exam, we earned 13 gold medals, um, 19, uh, excuse me, nine silver medals, six magna cum laude, five cum laude, right, I could keep on going, but I just, I think it's important to note how incredible our students are performing. Um, I already talked a little bit about athletics because of time, I think I'll keep going. So one of the other central uh, aspects of everything we do is that we engage the community. Um, so I have a couple examples up here. I mentioned the window into ARP, so thanks to Amherst Media. Uh, they film about twice a month this year, last year at once a month. They've been pleasant with me and letting me do twice a month. And these are films uh, with lots of high interest. We did one recently on the Yellow program, which that's an image from, um, so that the larger community can see whether it's online or on Amherst Media, uh, get to know what's happening in the schools. Uh, this year we've started an LPAC, which is an English language English Learners Parent Advisory Council, so CPAC is more familiar, that's the special education version of that. Um, and we had really strong turnout uh, with lots of translators, you can imagine, given our demographics, uh, come out for that because we want English, learner, English uh, learners, parents, and guardians to be actively part of our community. Um, to the right, when we started our dual language program, before we moved to actually a formal implementation plan, we went to every local, kind of the five largest local preschools in town, um, and shared, here's what we're thinking, what do you think? Because that was our demographic. It was incoming kindergarten students. They weren't all in our schools. Most of them weren't, families weren't connected to our schools yet, so we try to meet families where they are as much as we can. Uh, we have a Friday update that I send out every week. If anyone wants to get on that, you can just let me know. It just gives you an update of what's going on in the schools, and it might be, a, it's also online if you just want to check our website, but if you want to be added to the listserv, happy to add anyone on. Um, gives you a little bit, keeps you abreast of what's happening in our schools. We have a pretty significant social media presence. Um, and another example is, you know, we currently are starting uh, our principal search. We have a um, vacancy at the high school. And before we even start doing anything, the first thing we do is survey staff and families to say, what do you want to see in a high school principal? What attributes are important to you? What characteristics? And that infuses on every single area we do that we want that engagement. We want to uh, understand how the community, what they want to share uh, as we're having to make decisions. And the last slide. Um, and we'll open up for any questions. Um, so what are challenges? What are things I heard at the end of that uh, DPW presentation? What are, you know, what are some things that we have that are challenges? So uh, as those of you who attended the first four-town meeting know, we have a um, challenge of developing consensus on what's a long-term plan for the regional assessment methodology. Some of you have been in that for a long time and you know, have probably wrinkles from all the meetings that you've attended trying to work with four very di different communities on how do we fund our regional schools moving forward. Um, We've had flat state aid, so um, what that means is that local municipalities, including in, in this case Amherst, uh, are having to fund more because our um, increase in state aid is, is typically less than 1%. Our costs go up more than 1%, so therefore the towns are covering the difference. Um, there's a lot of unfairness to that, but that's our current reality. Uh, we talked about charter schools before. From an infrastructure organization point of view, we have two elementary schools, this is no surprise to probably anyone, who are in need of major costly work to remain viable. Um, and we talked last night at the Amherst School Committee meeting about the MSBA statement of interest process and certain decisions that certainly we would come back and talk in more detail with the town council in the next couple months. Uh, we have the middle school roof is failing, so we have that on our capital project at the region. We have the high school fields, which um, some of you may have been to. There was a meeting in the fall about the condition of the high school fields, um, and that's another thing that probably both the town and the schools a joint study and probably bring back to this group at some point. To the declining enrollment question, um, so right now we have five school buildings for 2,600 students. There's, whether that's a good thing or bad thing, that's not what I'm gonna weigh, but it's, it's inefficient, uh, financially inefficient to have five school buildings for 2,600 students. So I think an active part of our conversation is, are there more efficient ways to do it? Could we spend less on infrastructure and more on teachers and students? That's essentially the, the, what we're trying to think about. So we currently have a study kicking off that's looking at um, multiple models uh, at the regional level. So, you know, what would it mean if sixth grade went to the middle school? What would it mean if seventh and eighth grade went to the high school? So we've, uh, that was a capital request from last year, so that'll be an ongoing set of meetings, and, and there'll be three public meetings, one in January, February, and March. Uh, just looking at the infrastructure, not looking at the educational implications at this point, but trying to understand, you know, would new building, would new construction be needed to do that? Would everyone fit? What are the implications of that? 
Um, at the elementary level, certainly there's been active conversations about um, as that population and, and that enrollment has declined too, do we need three buildings? I, you know, some of the Pelham question that I received earlier has been one that, that we receive is are there other ways to organize ourselves that are more fiscally um, sound so that the towns get some relief from um, the impact that on, their, on their finances? From a teaching and learning perspective, we're responding to an increasing number of students who enroll in the district without high quality preschool. Um, there's one thing I want you to walk away with is that it's a major issue in our community. And so it, it ends up in the schools for a time being. It's a much broader issue about preschool access, um, something that I'm actively working on, um, but there's not necessarily an easy fix. But when we have students who um, don't have access to high quality education from you know, birth to five, they're already, um, research would indicate, at a huge disadvantage. Um, of being successful in their school experience and then beyond. Um, meeting social emotional well-being needs. We went to, uh, we did a lot of professional development last year about well-being of students. Um, there's been an increase in, uh, nationally about anxiety in students, secondary students. We've tried to, try to right-size our homework expectations, things like that. Um, but people's addiction to their, what's probably in front of everyone else, their phones, right? That's part of it. Uh, vaping. There's a lot of challenges for pre-adolescents and adolescents. And we're trying to develop a coherent plan of how to respond to them, how to support our students to make the best choices moving forward. Um, and then we want to ensure that our curriculum materials meet all the learners. So we have students who are uh, chomping at the bit for more, more, more. We have other students who need more assistance. And how do you differentiate, which is our, our jargony word, how do we differentiate our curriculum so that all students' needs are met, right? So we want to push all students to the outer edge of their potential. And how do we do that in a way, um, given that um, how students perceive themselves and their background experiences are quite diverse? So I don't think we're gonna, we can talk about food service if they ask, but I think at the time we'll, we'll hold on that. Sean was, Sean was excited to talk. I wasn't really excited. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think if it comes up in the questions, but I wanna give time for right. more questions. I know we went. Questions. Evan. Um, oh. In terms of our role, I mean, Building issues are a major issue in this town. So I, I guess it, we obviously approve some of that funding or the bonding if it needs bonded or things like that. And I know that's part of the role, but where do you, or if you know where the school committee stands, see our role in terms of any advising of what they're considering in terms of either combining or new buildings or all of that. I'd like to hear your perspective on that. Sure, so we talked about that last night, so it's sort of fresh in my mind. Um, we didn't get to a resolution place, but we actively had a conversation um, specifically about the statement of interest process uh, for the MSBA this year about where that gets slotted in, because statements of interest need to be signed by both the school, or but need to be voted uh, by both the school committee and, in this case, the town council, uh, given the change of government that we've had in this community. Um, so we tried to plot a timeline that gave the town council enough time where the town council wouldn't feel rushed if we get to a place of consensus, um, would be able to consider on its own, but I think there's a feeling also the school committee is doing a lot of work on the educational side of trying to think what's in the best interest of students. So. Uh, we had um, a slideshow I shared with the, the town manager, I think is gonna share with, with you all. Um, not that the, everything on that slide deck, it was broad agreement, it was my presentation last night. But we're actively looking to engage the broader community over the next two months about um, some of these issues. And one of the things that we talked about is certainly uh, utilizing or asking uh, town councilors to be an active part of, you know, where do we wanna have meetings? When are good meetings for people in your, Precincts? Can you help us advertise? Can you attend, perhaps, so that you're, you know, you feel informed about uh, what the community is talking about? Um, so, so we talked about that some. Um, I think the other thing that came up last night, and I don't think I'm speaking out of turn. I think it was broad consensus on the school committee that we'll need, whether it's a town manager or the town council, to give us some. There's some fiscal questions that are lingering, and um, I think that you know, more perhaps than just some of the educational aspects is something that, that we need to rely on, you know, the professional staff of the town and the town council on. Uh, so for instance, the, to put a finer point out, I'm not asking this question to be answered now, but I think it's a, a relevant question is, uh, you know, is the town willing to self-fund a school, right, and not rely on grant funds, right? That's a really hard question for, it's a question I won't answer. It's not my place to be actually weighing in on that one. Uh, but even for the school committee, I think that's a, a, like a place where whether it's the professional staff of the town or the town council, 
getting some direction, you know, uh, would be helpful. Um, not that they don't have their own opinions on that matter, and certainly I think the town manager, frankly, last fall gave his opinion pretty clearly uh, on that matter. But like those are the types of things that uh, the school committee doesn't want to operate in a vacuum, nor do I, and there's a natural, I guess, um, nexus where we need to meet uh, on that because all of the decisions that are made educationally have financial implications as well. Um, and you know, I think one of the school members, I think it's worth noting, said last night, um, actually, I'm sorry, it was a member of the public, it wasn't a school committee member, said, you know, we want to be conscious, but I've heard school committee members say it in the past, which is probably why I got confused. Uh, we want to be conscious that there's other building projects in town. So if, you know, Guilford was still here in the back of the room, I imagine he'd have some thoughts about building projects. If Sharon was here, I imagine she'd have thoughts, and if Tim was here, I'm guessing he has some things to say about capital improvements that are needed across the, the town. So that all comes to you all, right? So the school committee does their piece, they're going to advocate for what they think is right. And then you all have to weigh lots of competing variables, um, and that's going to be a real challenge. So um, I think those are some of the conversations that you know perhaps we need to start having. Does that answer? Yes. Okay. Uh, excuse me. Yes, Paul. Uh, well, I think one of the points that the superintendent uh, has made to me is that in terms of us going to the MSBA for funding, that it's super important for the town to be aligned and that, what does that mean? It means that the town council is aligned with the school committee and the presentation and the, and the identify and the goals that we're going to them with. So we have a relatively compressed time frame because this application is due April 12th. The school committee has sort of carved out February. We're sort of carving out March for the council to sort of grab, and there's a whole public process. But I think this to, this, to strengthen our application to the MSBA and to, uh, convey to them that the town is on the same page, the council and the school committee both have to be saying yes to the same thing. Would you support so that? So let me just ask a, a no, please. process possibility. Hypothetically, if the council, uh, those 10 of us that are district councilors, uh, committed to holding one of our district meetings in February, early March, and it, for a good share of that presentation, we would focus on the schools, making sure that that was widely publicized and on different evenings so that different people could be there. Would that be helpful? So can I add to Paul's and then answer yours? Mm-hmm. Excuse me, town managers. Sorry, we get along Please. all the time, so we call each other by our first names. Um, so I want to put a finer point on the town manager's statement. So mm -hmm. the feedback I received from the MSBA when we had a failed statement of interest last, you know, in 2018, uh, was very directly, we know your buildings are in poor shape. Every year's a new year. They have two huge projects right now. One is successfully moving forward in Somerville. It's over a quarter of a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. There's another one that's proposed in Arlington. That's uh, more than that. I think it's in the neighborhood of $300 million. So they're financially, you know, they're gonna be a little limited because those projects, they're in a fixed budget just like we are just like you are, right? And so there's the, the competition for non, for other projects is gonna heat up. So they, they're very clear, every year's a new year, we can't guarantee anything. But what they did said is, we know your buildings are in very poor condition, and what we're looking for is there to be consensus on a, on a plan moving forward. And that doesn't mean new or, you know, new construction or add reno, like that stuff that a build, future building committee uh, would have to sort out. But at a core level, you know, how big the school and are you replacing both schools or not, right? So that's the kind of core question the MSBA needs to have consensus. And they were very clear, and I said this last night, I'll say it again, like if you don't have that, you certainly can put in an application, but it may make sense to wait till 2020. Um, was the direct feedback that I received from MSBA. Um, I think that's, I could keep going, but I, um, I'm not sure it's probably appropriate for this setting for me to keep okay. going with you know, our discussions, um, or at least my vantage point on that, because I think they're probably a time. Okay. I'm just conscious of time. Your question directly, so we did talk last night, I think the challenge of um, organizing, I think we're better way to put it is we're meeting again next week, the school committee and I, mm -hmm. to map out a clear plan of engagements, mm -hmm. and we'll get back to you. Okay. Yeah, just I think the number of engagements and the time frame um, may warrant us to ask for maybe three meetings that, mm -hmm. right, which I know doesn't align with districts, um, but it, it's hard to schedule that many meetings um, in that time frame. So that's what we're discussing. So there's right. an active interest in town council involvement. 
the logistics, we still need probably one more meeting to sort through. Okay. Alyssa? I think it will be important to put something like that in writing, and I realize we do have the PowerPoint that we haven't had a chance to read yet, but as you develop that with the school committee, because in the past, statements of interest have just been a generic thing that we've signed off on at the select board level. Obviously, we're in a different body now, but the school committee did it, and we said, oh yeah, it sounds really scary, but it's fine to send your kids to these schools. They're not that scary. And then it went off its merry way, and I appreciate that you've been given additional direction based on our recent history and based on their budget constraints. But I think that makes it really different this year in, te in terms of it just being yet another checklist of all the things that are wrong with our building. So for us to really understand, I think we're going to have to look at some things that are in writing that are provided by you and the school committee to help us be able to understand it ourselves and then communicate it out to our constituents. What, what is it we need to do at what stage? Because as you indicated, many decisions are made far down the road, but in terms of reflecting that interest back to the MSBA. What can we do here? Because this is different. We've never had to do this before. Yeah. Got it. And if, Mandy Jo. Oh, sorry. I, I just wanted to follow up on Lynn with the forum, with the district meetings. There is a requirement in the charter for the school committee to have at least one forum on schools. So this might be a good time to do that. Right. Additional questions, comments? Oh, I'm sorry, Evan. I think what I was going to say earlier uh, has probably been spoken to to, to uh, some extent. Um, one of the things I'm trying to wrap my head around is uh, obviously with the last project, uh, it received the support of the school committee, it received the support of uh, the voters, it failed in the legislative body. Uh, we are now the legislative body. Uh, my assumption is the MSBA uh, is very curious as to how we will uh, operate and, and whether or not uh, we would see in, in this new legislative body uh, something similar. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming that they will be more likely to uh, get us into the process if they have confidence that, uh, you know, we, we are, um, that we will approve the funding should it get to the same point. Uh, I'm trying to wrap my head around how we give them that confidence. Uh, you know, pass it, uh, voting on a statement of interest seems like a fairly milk toast, uh, uh, you know, statement of support because the statement of interest is is very bare bones, um, and so maybe a little bit from your perspective of what what you see the role of the council in this process beyond just reaching out to constituents, um, but also what you think the council uh, needs to do to show the MSBA. Uh, that to, to give them that confidence that the same thing won't happen again. Yeah. So thanks, and that's a great question. And, and so I'll put a little finer point uh, or more detailed uh, comment, and I was gonna, going to after Ms. Brewer spoke. Um, so what they're looking for in our MSBA is an additional statement, formal statement that defines kind of at a broad level what we want. And what they're talking about is, you know, roughly what's the school size uh, and roughly, is a re and, and, and are we intending it to replace both of the outdated elementary schools or not? They're not looking, and I'm just, I, I made this point probably ad nauseum last night, but I'm in a new setting. They're not looking for addition renovation, they're not looking for the spirit of the net zero law. Like, all that stuff's important, who the architects are gonna be, the specific educational plan with all the details worked out. They would find that inappropriate to be in the statement of interest, because there's a whole process they have to lay that out. Because of our past history, um, and you know what they want to see is that we have some consensus um, that we're talking about roughly the same thing. So are they going to look for every small detail? No, but it's not just the traditional standard of interest. They're looking for a formal paragraph in there that really defines, we're looking for a school roughly, I'm going to say a silly number because I don't want to say a real number because then people will look into it, right? <laughs> so they're going to look for, like, we want an elementary school with 10,000 students in it, and it's not going to replace both buildings, right? That would be a, you know, a statement that the lat level of detail, and they want that statement to be endorsed by both the school committee and then the town council, and that's why they want it in the SOI. They don't want it later, because my assumption, when I was talking to them, so oh, give us a little more time, we can work on it maybe by summer, and they were emphatic that it, it's either in the SOI or it's not in the SOI. It's not something that can be an addendum that comes later, and if they felt like that wasn't gonna work for our community, or if our community couldn't gather around that, then that's the statement of maybe 2020 is a better option for our application. Um, I have all sorts of thoughts on that, but probably better to hold them, see if there's other questions okay. on other topics. Yes, Dorothy. Um, oh, there's so, so many parts that go into this, and for example, the question is that you, you brought up of 
reconfiguring um, the sixth and seventh grade, maybe going from the elementary schools or to the middle schools or from the middle school to the high school. Wouldn't we need to have that information first? So um, my honest answer is there's always going to be something like that in this community that we could say. We could wait till the regionalization discussion ends. We could wait till lots of things end. And I think there's good reasons, the logical point of view. Uh, I don't think our buildings, my personal opinion is, I don't think our buildings can wait for the adults. I don't think our students can wait for the adults to sort through all those things. So, and I don't mean that to be flip at all. It's just, I think we're getting to the place where we need to take action and we need to take action soon. A staff member last night at the school committee in public comment, you know, I think accurately described the buildings that now as barriers. Um, like they were always concerns and now they've crossed that threshold to being barriers. Wildwood, the average typical life of a school building, the MSBA would say is 50 years. So Wildwood will be 50 next year, and Fort River will be 50 um, a couple years after that, and they weren't well designed to begin with. Um, so I do think uh, a reasonable kind of middle ground could be saying, um, I could imagine having a conversation of we want an elementary school of X number of students. There's, other, there's lots of ways to get there, and we can figure out some of those details later on in the process, but if we can get the community to say two core questions, are we, are we saying we're replacing both buildings or not, and roughly what's the school size to do there? Because there's lots of different ways to um, replace buildings. You know, you talked about sixth grade to the middle school. There's also the Pelham piece. Um, there's a building at other places. There's a whole variety, and we've gotten great public feedback and emails, I want to say, from the community with all sorts of creative solutions that, um, that I, I want to speak for the school committee that I hadn't thought of. Uh, but I think if we can answer those two core questions with rough, here's what we're thinking, we, some of those other pieces, about six to seven, we'll sort out. That study, we expect to be done by the end of March. Um, so we'll probably have to be closer to a decision at that point. Um, but we're, we're doing our best to get all the data and all the information so we can make the best decisions. But I, my personal opinion, I've said this publicly at the school committee level, is I think we should make a commitment as a community that our kindergartners don't graduate from open classroom sixth grades classrooms. You know, another way to put it, which someone said is, that babies born in 2019 should never be in an open classroom, right? Depending on your demographic, one may be more relevant, relevant than the other. Uh, I don't think our buildings will sustain, I think the capital costs, and you may have heard of that, I know that's another conversation we'll come back to, to require those buildings to be open for that length of time um, is gonna get more and more significant, and um, I agree with the staff members who are telling us something's gotta give. It does seem to me that the issue of grade configuration is probably one of the more divisive issues yeah. so that as I personally think about this, I believe that has to be a converse, part of the conversation. Yeah. So, yeah. And perhaps, again, not to speak for the school committee, but they've, they've been very clear that they, um, actually, I'll just leave it at that. I don't want to speak for them. I'll okay. Back. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Alyssa. If I could just follow up on that really briefly, I think it's really important for everyone to remember the school committee can decide on grade configuration tomorrow. Right. The school committee gets to decide right. that. It doesn't matter how upset it makes the rest of the community. So I think that that is an important part of our conversation. But as you keep saying, although we need to be thinking about those possibilities in terms of that number they want, they want the number. They don't want us to say, well, if it's K-5, then it's this number. Well, wait, if it's pre-K, then it's this number. They want a number. Right. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, I'd like to thank you very much. You can um, probably move to the side. This has been extremely uh, informative, and obviously you can tell there's lots of interest on the part of the counselors. Yeah, and we just want to thank schools. the counselors for having us and welcoming us in this morning. We really enjoyed the interaction and more to come. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, we now will have time for public comment. Is there anybody who would like to make a comment? Okay. Please identify yourself by name, address, and we ask that you keep your comments to three minutes and the uh, council does not respond to your comments. My name is Ginny Hamilton. I live at 140 Middle Street in South Amherst. And um, thank you. I mainly want to say thank you, and I can do that in less than three minutes. I attended the school committee meeting last night um, and wanted to come this morning to hear 
the school's presentation in context of DPW, and I hope you were having similar meetings with the library director and the fire chief uh, soon as well, because as you all know better than anyone in this town, those are the four competing major projects um, that are um, on the table for our town right now. And there's a significant interdependence between them, um, and there's gonna be trade-offs that we have to be making looking at, at all of these projects. Um, listening to the public comments last night at the school committee, much of it was talking about the educational impacts of our buildings. And I want to repeat what Dr. Morris said, teachers stood up and said that the conditions in those schools are interfering with the ability of our kids to learn. Um, and to add, as a Crocker parent, um, you know, Crocker has windows, Crocker has walls in all of our classrooms. It's a great school, but it's got infra uh, infrastructure problems as well. Apparently the temperature in the gym yesterday was 42 degrees. So there are maintenance issues that are very real, and you all have seen those numbers as well, um, as well as the longer term infrastructure. And privately, however, what was interesting is nobody talked about money in the comments last night. But privately, when we're sharing these numbers about the school projections and the maintenance costs, the main thing I'm hearing from people is, how is this town, how are we gonna pay for this? And that's what we've elected you all to, to struggle with um, and to find those trade-offs. So, you know, if looking at the Fort River um, building projections for a second, if school committee were to send a proposal to you all for two new buildings, that's 90 to $130 million for two, based on the latest numbers. So you would all have to look at how does that affect the water treatment facility, much less a new P DPW building. These are very real costs in a town that is very demanding of the services that we want and we expect, especially for our children. Um, and as we all know, construction costs are getting higher particularly when we set such high standards for net zero and high lead certifications, which I totally support. We want to be that sort of leadership, but it means that the costs are real. So I wanna thank you for taking these on, and I also want to urge you um, to take them on sooner rather than later. We can't keep kicking these major capital expenses down the road. It's only going to make them more expensive. So. Um, I hope that those conversations that are happening are just right around the corner, not much farther down the road. And I appreciate you all taking this on. Thank you. Is, are there any other public comments? Just as a matter of communication, uh, uh, the town manager and I have been discussing a February focus on capital projects, and uh, so that we're not kicking it down the road. I'm not responding to you, particularly Ginny, but to everybody in town. Uh, and we'll be working on that as well as looking for a way that we can assist in the town coming to consensus on the schools. Is there any other comment from counselors at this time? Uh, do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Okay, second was from Sarah. And anything else? All those in favor? Uh, we can do a hand raising tonight or this morning because we're not doing remote. Okay, there was unanimous from all of us that are attending. Excuse me, Alyssa? Could the communications committee stick around for a minute so we can schedule a meeting? Thank you.